Tonight, a photograph jolts the federal election campaign. I'm really sorry. Justin Trudeau addresses an old photo that shows him in brown face. The apology, the reaction, and where it leaves the campaign. Also tonight, an Ontario teen needed life support after vaping. Are airlines complying with the new passengers' rights rules? We have some news for, for everyone. And Canada's golden couple is ready to hang up their skates. This is The National. A stunning revelation tonight that has Justin Trudeau's election campaign trying to do some serious and urgent damage control. Time magazine has published a photo of him from 2001 wearing brown face. So this is it. The photo was taken from a yearbook from Vancouver's West Point Grey Academy. That's where Trudeau taught. His campaign says he was dressed as a character from Aladdin. Trudeau acknowledged there was another incident where he was in blackface in high school. Late tonight, a photo of that has emerged. And so, Rosie, these photos have spawned quick and intense reactions. Yeah, throughout the evening, Adrian, it came first from Jagmeet Singh, the NDP leader, Andrew Scheer, of course, the Conservative leader weighed in, and from Trudeau himself. In a scrum with reporters on a plane late tonight, he told Canadians he's sorry, that he should have known better, and, as you alluded to there, that it's not the only such incident in his past. As David Cochran explains, it's a hit to Trudeau's image at a crucial time. This is certainly not how Canadians are used to seeing a Prime Minister who likes to say that diversity is Canada's strength. Justin Trudeau in a turban and robe, dark makeup on his face, neck and hands. It's certainly not how Trudeau wants to be seen in an election campaign. I dressed up in an Aladdin costume and put makeup on. I shouldn't have done that. I should have known better, but I didn't. And I'm really sorry. Time magazine published the picture, which was taken at an Arabian Nights themed event at the Vancouver Private School where Trudeau taught in 2001. It forced Trudeau to hold an emergency news conference aboard his plane at the Halifax airport to try to explain himself. Is that the only time in your life you've ever done something like that? Uh, when I was in high school, I uh, dressed up at a uh, talent show uh, and sang Dale. In, with 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 uh, with makeup on, I'm going to be uh, asking Canadians to forgive me for what I did. I shouldn't have done that. I take responsibility for it. It was a dumb thing to do. I'm disappointed in myself. I'm pissed off at myself for having done it. I wish I hadn't done it, but I did it, and I apologize for it. Trudeau has made diversity a bedrock principle of his government, emphasizing it in his cabinet, where Canadians of diverse backgrounds hold major roles. During this campaign, the Liberals have repeatedly attacked the Conservatives for controversial social media posts, many of them racially insensitive. But now, this. It's been a core tactic of the Liberal campaign to this point to try to paint Andrew Scheer and his party as racially intolerant, and now it's the Liberals who are scrambling to contain a bombshell, as it's their leader who champions diversity and multiculturalism, who was photographed dressed in brownface, and he's done it more than once. David Cochran, CBC News, Halifax. We wanted to bring you more of what Justin Trudeau had to say about all this earlier this evening for the record. I shouldn't have done that. I should have known better, but I didn't. And I'm really sorry. Hey, how do you feel about this coming out right now in the campaign? Uh, obviously, I, I regret uh, that I did it. Uh, it's not about timing, it's about having done something that I shouldn't have done, and I'm really sorry I did. Have you done, the only time you've done something like this, Mr. Trudeau? Is that the only time in your life you've ever done something like that? Uh, when I was in high school, I uh, dressed up at a uh, talent show uh, and sang Dale in, with, 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 uh, with makeup on. Uh, I take responsibility for my uh, decision to do that. I shouldn't have done it, I should have known better. Uh, it was something that uh, I didn't think was racist at the time, but now I recognize um, it was something racist to do, and I am deeply sorry. And why should you be allowed to stay? Um, I'm going to be uh, asking Canadians to forgive me for what I did. I shouldn't have done that. I take responsibility for it. It was a dumb thing to do. I'm disappointed in myself. I'm pissed off at myself for having done it. I wish I hadn't done it, but I did it, and I apologize for it. I'm, 
pissed off at myself, obviously. I'm disappointed in myself, and uh, I'm apologizing to Canadians. What does taking responsibility mean? What is the consequence for you? For, for a, your, a lot of your candidates, this would be at least calls for resignation. This would be calls for important conversations with all those candidates and uh, real staking, taking stock in the path forward. And I'm having conversations with, with uh, my colleagues, with fellow candidates, and I'm going to be continuing to having conversations uh, with Canadians about this and about many other things that we're uh, hoping to work together on positively. You, was this photo racist in your opinion? Yes. Yes, it was. I didn't consider it uh, a racist action at the time, but now we know better. And this was something that was unacceptable. And yes, racist. I think it's it's well known that communities uh, and people who live with intersectionalities and face uh, discrimination, uh, the likes of which I have uh, never uh, personally had to experience, uh, is uh, is a significant thing that is very hurtful. And that's why I am so deeply disappointed in myself. Did you How be are you going to explain this to your children? I'm going to have a conversation with them tomorrow morning before they go to school about taking responsibility uh, for mistakes you make, about uh, living up every day to try and be a better person and recognizing uh, that when you make mistakes, you have to take responsibility for it, you have to own up for it, and you have to promise to do better. That's what I expect of my kids. That's how I'm going to be raising them. And that's certainly the conversation that I'm going to be having with them tomorrow. Uh, the fact of the matter is that I've I've always, uh, and you'll know this, been uh, more enthusiastic uh, about costumes uh, than uh, is somehow uh, is sometimes appropriate. Uh, but uh, uh, these are the situations that uh, that uh, I regret deeply. Reaction to this photo, obviously pouring in tonight from the other political parties. We'll take you to the conservative reaction in just a moment. But let's start with NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. Our Hannah Thibodeau is traveling with him. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh responded for the second time tonight regarding the photo of Justin Trudeau. He said he did so because the first time he hadn't seen it for himself. And once he did, he said that he was stunned. He also got a phone call from a close friend talking about a racist incident that had happened to him. Singh wouldn't disclose what that was, but you could tell it made him extremely emotional. And seeing this image today, the kids that see this image, the people that see this image, are going to think about all the times in their life that they were made fun of, that they were hurt, that they were hit, that they were insulted, that they were made to feel less because of who they are. And I want to talk to those people right now. I want to talk to all the kids out there, all the folks who live this and now are grown up and are still feeling the pain of racism. I want you to know that you might feel like giving up on Canada. You might feel like giving up on yourselves. I want you to know that you have value, you have worth, and you are loved. Trudeau did apologize. However, Singh says tonight is not about Trudeau. He says he wants people to know who've been mocked for the color of their skin, as well as a child who even had his turban ripped off, that they're loved. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Mississauga. Andrew Shear was door knocking and campaigning in Toronto when this story first broke. His team decided to wait to hear what Justin Trudeau had to say before weighing in. He flew to Quebec, exited his plane, and condemned Justin Trudeau's previous behavior. Like all Canadians, I was extremely shocked and disappointed when I learned of Justin Trudeau's actions this evening. Wearing brown face is an act of open mockery and racism. It was just as racist in 2001 as it is in 2019. And what Canadians saw this evening is someone with a complete lack of judgment and integrity and someone who's not fit to govern this country. Scheer did not specifically call on Trudeau to resign, though his words were very firm. He also didn't take any questions tonight, and he will answer questions tomorrow at his regularly scheduled news conference. What happened with Trudeau is going to neutralize a line of attack from the Liberals against the Conservatives. The Liberal War Room had tried to attack certain Conservative candidates for controversial statements and social media postings in the past. It forced Andrew Scheer to say that if a candidate had said something uncomfortable or considered offensive in the past, as long as they owned up to their mistake and apologized, he'd be willing to work with them. It's a tactic that leaders during this election campaign had expected the Liberals to try more, but today's development will neutralize that line of attack. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Sherbrooke, Quebec. 
Fleema Shifty joins me now to talk a little more about this. So obviously, uh, this has the potential to be extremely damaging for Trudeau's re-election campaign. Obviously, they're thinking about some of the different factors at play. Salima, give us a sense of what that might be. Absolutely, Rosie. So this is the ghost, of course, that has haunted American politicians now hitting Canada and the campaign trail here like a bomb in this campaign. But the difference here is that this wasn't that long ago. In 2001, Justin Trudeau was 29 years old, a teacher, not an elected official, not that young either. And this was a second incident. He just revealed that he dressed up in dark makeup in high school as well. So the question for many would be that how could he not have known this is racist and so effective? Offensive to visible minorities at 29 years old. And what's more, what that tells Canadians from minority groups. So those Canadians live in the urban areas where Trudeau needs to win votes. But that's really only part of the political fallout here. This hits right at Trudeau's reputation that he's carefully built, positioning himself as the champion of diversity, of minorities, defending the rights of the marginalized, particularly as he's campaigning against another federal party leader, Jagmeet Singh of the NDP, who is Sikh, who wears a turban. And there's still a lot of questions here. Is there anything else out there? Why didn't Trudeau reveal earlier that this photo was out there? And why did his campaign team launch attacks on some conservative candidates for past racist or homophobic comments when he himself had this in his past. What he did say today, just uh, earlier tonight, is he will have to work harder to convince Canadians he is the leader he said he was. That is undoubtedly true. Where elections go is always surprising, and tonight certainly was one. Thanks, Salima. Appreciate it. You're welcome. So we've heard a few times tonight that voters will decide for themselves if they can accept Justin Trudeau's apology for donning that offensive brown face. Of course, that's true. So Greg Rasmussen went out to the streets of Vancouver to see how some of you are reacting. On Vancouver's Robson Street, people reacted after seeing the photo for the first time. He's enjoying, he's young, and he's not responsible for the country. So I guess he's allowed to have fun, right? The only way I think there would come change with this ideology of race is when I stop taking offense to something like this. I think these people are just too sensitive nowadays because we really have to worry about the bigger, bigger picture, personally. I think as a teacher, he probably should have exercised better judgment. And I would maybe, I mean, I do question his judgment still as a leader. So you can't really go back and say, look at someone 10, 20 years ago and say, you did this. For this woman, it's a complicated issue. Her parents grew up under apartheid in South Africa. You know, I've had friends who are Caucasian who've done this in recent years, and I've had to speak out on it. But that's recently, and I think people should have enough intelligence to know it's not okay now. However, many years ago, it might have been just funny. Today, the school where Justin Trudeau taught was quiet and no one was speaking. But nearby, people weighed in on the photo. In the context of today, he shouldn't have done it. In the context of a costume party, in 2001, I, I guess, but that's still offensive. It'll be used against him quite a bit. It'll be a headline for probably an entire week or so, but will it make or break his campaign? Not really. And that, in the middle of an election campaign, is the critical issue, the impact of this photo. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. Of course, we'll try and talk to more of you in the coming hours and days about all of this. But earlier this evening, Canadian YouTube star Lily Singh tweeted that Trudeau would be on her new late night show. That tweet has now been deleted. I'll remind you that At Issue will be on this program tomorrow to talk about the fallout. And later in this show, we will dig into what the leaders were promising to voters before all of this derailed their messaging. Adrian, back to you. All right, Rosie, let's turn to other news now. Health officials revealed today an Ontario high school student was put on life support after using e-cigarettes on a daily basis. Seven deaths in the U.S. have been linked to vaping, as well as hundreds of cases of illness. As Katie Nicholson shows us, those concerns have come to Canada. Andrew Makijani is all about healthy living. Except for one little thing, he vapes. The only thing it kind of gives me some time is that, um, like, a uh, buzz. That buzz killed today by Canada's first case of vaping-related illness in a London-area teen. They had quite a severe illness course, including uh, ICU life support. Uh, the individual recovered. Officials wouldn't say which vaping product the patient used or how much of it. 
In the U.S., where there have been nearly 400 cases of vaping-related illnesses and seven deaths, the Centers for Disease Control found most cases involved the use of THC products. That's information this vape store owner says is crucial. I think it's very important to, to see what the actual product was that's caused this damage. And we didn't get to the heart of the matter. Despite that, vaping researcher David Hammond says two things are clear. So number one, we need to get a better handle of the industry and what's in these products. Number two, it just reinforces the message that young people should not be vaping. This is not a benign or harmless activity. It's something Ontario will now keep tabs on. Today, its health minister ordered hospitals to track all serious cases of vaping-related illnesses. To um, understand exactly what the scope of the problem is. It's something Alberta is already doing. And just this afternoon, the B.C. health minister called for more to be done to control who is vaping what. Tougher laws. Doing the work will involve more enforcement. Doing the work will involve engaging with young people. Back at the gym, news of the teen vapor's hospitalization sinking in and making an impact. I'm going to quit by December because, I don't know, I feel like... Oh, that's I'm, good. I'm proud of yeah. you. <laughs> no, just a little gets... less puffing and a little more huffing and puffing. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. There is a cascade of concern over vaping. Just today, India announced a total ban on e-cigarettes, joining Brazil, Thailand, and more than 30 other countries. Also today, CBS and Warner Media, which owns CNN, say they are pulling all advertising for vaping products. Apprehension is clearly in the air. On Friday, our national panel will have more information for you. Canada's new airline passenger rights have been in place for about two months now, and complaints are already piling up. Travelers say airlines have sometimes resisted paying the new penalties. Jacqueline Hansen begins with one couple's very big disappointment. The best part was... A once-in-a-lifetime honeymoon to Italy cut short when Chelsea Williamson and her husband were bumped from their flight. I was a bit shocked that we didn't find out about it until we were actually trying to board the aircraft. At the gate, they were told WestJet had switched to a smaller aircraft. They were put on a later flight and missed five hours of sightseeing. Williamson complained to WestJet, expecting it to be covered by Canada's new airline passenger rights. It doesn't qualify for denied boarding under the new regulations. WestJet said it didn't meet the bar. Instead, it offered credits of $125 each. But according to the new rules, passengers who are denied boarding and delayed less than six hours are entitled to $900. Maybe they were hoping that I wasn't as informed as I was and they could just skate by by kind of offering a whoops, sorry. Williamson complained to the Canadian Transportation Agency. Since the new denied boarding rules came into effect in mid-July, the CTA says it's received 147 complaints. 67 involve Air Canada, 24 against WestJet, and 27 against other airlines. I expect there'll be thousands more complaints um, per year, and that's a good thing. There are more rules coming in December that cover delays and cancellations. All the major Canadian airlines say they intend to fully comply. We'll have a transitional period when uh, when these rules are tested, if you will, and hopefully they'll be settled down fairly quickly. In Williamson's case, WestJet says, following an internal investigation, we recognize that we failed to meet our obligations to these guests. Complaining paid off. WestJet sent the couple $900 each. Now the transportation agency is investigating whether WestJet's policies on flight changes comply with the new rules. The airline says it's cooperating. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. More news just ahead on The National, including more reaction to our top story, that photo emerging showing Justin Trudeau in brown face. Plus, more critically important information for you this election season, how to spot a fake when it turns up in your Facebook feed. And an update on the cleanup from Hurricane Dorian. What's happened to that crane that came crashing down? We're back in two minutes. Let's get to Ian in our national newsroom in Vancouver. He's watching developing stories for us right now. 
And Adrian, let's start just south of Ontario in Michigan State, where cases of a deadly mosquito-borne virus have prompted health officials to urge people not just to guard against mosquito bites, but in some cases remain indoors entirely. I cannot even comprehend that just one little bite from one little mosquito could be this devastating. The death toll from the rare virus known as Triple E has risen to three in Michigan. There are seven cases confirmed across the state. Symptoms include fever, chills, and muscle and joint pain, and it could lead to swelling in the brain. All of this so serious that officials in the state are encouraging people to cancel or reschedule any outdoor events at and after dusk. In Nova Scotia, the provincial government has declared a local state of emergency in Halifax, but it turns out it's all about dealing more quickly with that crane that was toppled by Hurricane Dorian. It was 11 days ago the storm knocked over the crane. Local businesses were complaining about how long they've been waiting for the damage to be fixed. The provincial government says the state of emergency will speed things up. And you've probably heard of the popularity of Beyond Meat products, so it was a surprise from Tim Hortons today to hear that they're scaling back the availability of the plant-based menu items. The chain introduced the products this summer to much fanfare, but Tim Hortons' parent company says it was just a limited-time offer and will soon only be available in B.C. and Ontario. There's a hurricane hitting Bermuda right now, and we'll have the latest on that in about 20 minutes. And still ahead on the national, more reaction to the breaking news tonight. A photo has surfaced showing Justin Trudeau in brown face. Plus, in-depth, online. How does something that starts out true wind up posted, shared, liked, and retweeted into a lie? And how do you untangle all of that? But first. Uh, Tess and Scott here. Um... We have some news. In case you missed it, Tessa Virtue and Scott Moyer are leaving figure skating. It just feels for us like it's the right time to say goodbye. They made the announcement in an emotional Twitter video. This is so personal and, yeah. and emotional for both of us. 2010 is when they captured the hearts of Canadians and won their first Olympic medal in Vancouver. It's the right color, it's the color we wanted. Since then, they have become the most decorated figure skaters in Olympic history. The energy that they have is so honest. Kurt Browning said along with being very nice people, the pair's 22-year-long career leaves a special imprint on the sport. They leave a legacy that lifts up other skaters to shoot for and fans to mourn for. They have announced their retirement before, you might remember that, but for now, Virtue and Moyer will be cheering for those who come next. The next generation of skaters is going to blaze new trails, break all of our records, and we can't wait to cheer them on. And while this is goodbye, Virtue and Moyer do have one final tour this fall before they leave the ice for good. We love you all. We love you so much. Bye. Oh, not bye. We still got to I take responsibility for my uh, decision to do that. I shouldn't have done it. I should have known better. Uh, it was something that uh, I didn't think was racist at the time, but now I recognize um, it was something racist to do, and I am deeply sorry. What does this mean for your Liberal leader Justin Trudeau holding an emergency news conference tonight aboard his plane, addressing a photo that has jolted his campaign and the election. The photo is this one. It dates back to 2001, published today in Time magazine. Trudeau, with his face and hands darkened, wearing a costume at an Arabian Nights-themed party at a Vancouver high school where he was a teacher. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh addressed Canadians tonight about the photo, and his message was one of solidarity for Canadians who may know all too well that sting of racism. And seeing this image today, the kids that see this image, and the people that see this image, are going to think about all the times in their life that they were made fun of, that they were hurt, that they were hit, that they were insulted, that they were made to feel less because of who they are. And I want to talk to those people right now. I want to talk to all the kids out there, all the folks who live this and now are growing up and are still feeling the pain of racism. I want you to know that you might feel like giving up on Canada. You might feel like giving up on yourselves. I want you to know that you have value, you have worth, and you are loved. And I don't want you to give up on Canada, and please don't give up on yourselves. There's so many people in this country that believe in taking care of one another. I know it's hard to believe right now, 
but there are. And together, we are going to come together and take care of one another. So seeing this image is going to be hard for a lot of people. It's going to bring up a lot of pain. It's going to bring up a lot of hurt. Please reach out to your loved ones. Please reach out to people who are suffering in silence right now. Please let them know that they are loved and they are celebrated for who they are. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer's reaction was short, and he did not take any questions tonight, but here's what he had to say. Like all Canadians, I was extremely shocked and disappointed when I learned of Justin Trudeau's actions this evening. Wearing brown face is an act of open mockery and racism. It was just as racist in 2001 as it is in 2019. And what Canadians saw this evening is someone with a complete lack of judgment, and integrity, and someone who's not fit to govern this country. Green Party leader Elizabeth May says tonight on Twitter she's, quote, deeply shocked by the photo, adding that Trudeau must apologize for the harm done and commit to learning and appreciate the requirement to model social justice leadership at all levels of government. She goes on to say, in this matter, he has failed. The People's Party of Canada leader Maxime Bernier also tweeted a reaction, saying that Trudeau is the master of identity politics, and the Liberals just spent months accusing everyone of being white supremacist. He goes on to say that Trudeau definitely is the biggest hypocrite in the country. This is a moment in the campaign that could, of course, change everything. But before that, news broke just a few hours ago. It was actually a pretty normal day on the campaign trail. Trudeau focusing on a new promise, zeroing in on seniors, while the NDP and Conservatives laid out plans that could appeal to voters of all ages. Here's what they're promising. These are choices that we would make. This is a priority for us. The NDP says it will offer free dental care to households making under $70,000 a year if they don't have other coverage. It is bold. It is exciting. I'm kind of getting goosebumps when I think about it. The Conservatives say they can find $1.5 billion in savings by scrapping some federal funding for businesses. We'll cancel handouts to wealthy corporate executives, shareholders, and foreign companies so that your morning bus commute will cost you a little less. And the Liberals are focusing on seniors, pledging to boost old age security by 10 percent at age 75, and the Canada Pension Plan by 25 percent for widows and widowers. Seniors have built the Canada that we know and love today, and they deserve to enjoy their golden years to the fullest. How the election campaign was playing out before that uh, photo was released later this evening. A reminder and a good one that at issue will be here tomorrow to try and dig into what this means to the politicians and to the campaigns. Adrian, back to you. All right, Rosie. Next on The National, we go in-depth on your social media feed. Separating fact from fiction, a crucial skill in this election season. That's next. Barely over a week into this campaign, and as you've seen tonight with Trudeau's brown face photo, images have serious impact. It's significant when it's true, as it is in this case, but even lies can carry a lot more weight than you might realize. You may know it as fake news. We saw it in Brexit, in the 2016 U.S. election, and yes, of course it seeps into Canadian feeds. But fake news is too broad a term. It's become meaningless. Really, when you break it down, it's about two things. Misinformation, that's the stuff people spread mistakenly, that they don't know is wrong or out of context. And then there's disinformation, the lies people spread intended to deceive. But what makes these lies fly? What's their fuel? Kaylee Rogers follows one example of disinformation from start to finish. This is complicated. But the spread of misleading information is just that. It's messy. You can't always tell where it's going to go. But we know where this particular one ends. Canada moves to ban Christians from demonstrating in public. It's inaccurate on a number of levels, but it was shared more than 16,000 times. That's real damage done. The question is, how? How did we get here? Well, let's go back to the very beginning. 
At the start of all this is something true, a private member's bill introduced in Ontario's legislature in March. Would the member for York Centre like to explain his bill? Thank you, Speaker. The bill amends the Legislative Assembly Act to prohibit any demonstration, rally, or other activity that, in the opinion of the Speaker, is likely to promote hatred against any identifiable group from being permitted on the legislative precinct grounds. Was there anything in particular that prompted this? Were there demonstrations that were happening at Queen's Park that were raising concerns? Uh, regretfully, in 2017, we've seen uh, a demonstration that called for the shooting of Israelis. Um, we've seen a demonstration that called for uh, buzz bombing and murder of innocent civilians. Freedom of speech doesn't give anyone the right to promote hate speech. Mm -hmm. This is about prohibiting hate speech and incitement to violence on the grounds of Queen's Park. So the bill is that nugget of truth where the spread begins. A week later, a site called Canadian Jewish News covers the story. It focuses on the bill's message of stopping hate rallies and preventing the spread of anti-Semitic ideology. It also includes a direct interview with Babber. Using a tool called CrowdTangle, we can get a sense of the number of interactions the story got. Things like retweets, likes, comments, and shares. The piece got about 75 interactions, and the story was only active on social media for a day. Last year, Statistics Canada revealed that police reported hate crimes rose sharply in 2017. Almost three weeks later, the story gets picked up again. LifeSite News, a site mainly covering abortion issues, writes a piece. They interpret the bill as potentially preventing people with views against abortion from expressing those opinions. And this is where we start to see more emotionally charged language come into play. They're using terms like anti-sex ed and homosexual agenda stories that use those kinds of headlines are trying to tap into those emotions. My name is Samantha Bradshaw. Uh, I'm a researcher on the Computational Propaganda Project at Oxford University. You know, there's that old saying that sex and violence sells, and that's because people like to consume this kind of content because it's very emotional um, and it gets us feeling certain things. Anger, uh, frustration, anxiety, fear. Uh, these are all very powerful emotions that get people uh, sharing and consuming content. Adding that layer of emotion works. This piece spreads further than the last one, staying active for eight days. There are close to 900 interactions online, mostly on Facebook. This came out a couple of weeks after the bill's second reading. One thing to keep in mind here is there's no new reporting. It gets moved forward by way of opinion, though it's often framed as news. Layering on little truths uh, and taking little truths and stretching them, uh, misreporting them, uh, implementing commentary and treating commentary and someone's opinion about what happened as news um, are some of the content strategies that we see to try to get these news stories go viral. A little over a week later, another layer of opinion is added. A site called The Post Millennial publishes a piece suggesting the bill in trying to stop hate will also, quote, silence legitimate political expression. It doesn't do as well. It's only active for a couple of days. The social reach was small, though still more than 200 interactions. But that's not where this story dies. More than two weeks later, that's almost two months after the bill's introduction, another piece from LifeSite News goes big. Ontario Bill threatens to criminalize Christian speech as hate. It's a bold headline attached to what is essentially a republished press release from a socially conservative advocacy group. This is the first time a headline specifically calls the bill anti-Christian, and you can see they've used a more dramatic image here. It says censored free speech. Now before, when we talked about reach, we were talking in the hundreds. This reached thousands. It got more than 8,000 interactions on Facebook across two dozen groups. This is where it gets bigger and messier. Just two days later, a huge source known for spreading disinformation picks up the story. A US-based site, Big League Politics, writes that sensational headline, Canada moves to ban Christians from demonstrating in public. Ads plastered all over. This piece is also rife with conspiracy theories about, quote, ISIS terrorists, and Canada being, quote, restrictive towards Christianity. This story and all its inaccuracies reached more people than any other and kept spreading for more than two weeks. It got more than 24,000 interactions on Facebook across more than 100 groups. By tracking it in this way, 
we can see misleading tactics being executed over time. This nugget of truth being obscured by layers of opinion and emotion added on top until we get here at a story that has little to do with reality. Oh yeah, this is one of the samples that we found that just seemed extreme. <laughs> we showed the site to Roman Babber. Of course, the article gets the level of government wrong. It's um, Ontario, but it's not even Ontario in this case. It's a single member of Ontario's parliament. I think it's important that we stick to the facts as they are. Here's the thing. There's always going to be junk news online. But experts like Bradshaw say if we can understand how it spreads and where it comes from, we can better spot it when it scrolls across our feeds. At the end of the day, democracy is really hard work. It's up to us to put in that time and effort to fact check our information, uh, to look at other sources, to look at the other side of the argument and weigh and debate and discuss. So emotion, outrage, Kelly, these are hardly new tools to, to sway voters. What's the distinction then between disinformation and just basic politicking? So it can get really tricky, and I have brought a couple examples just to try and piece it apart. So these are a couple memes that have gone viral online over the last week, and they're based on a rumor that started in August that the head of the RCMP is married to a relative of Finance Minister Bill Morneau. And because of this, they're saying that's why the RCMP hasn't looked as heavily into the SNC-Lavalin affair as people would like them to. Now, this is not true. Morneau has told us that there's no relation. The RCMP told us this, and we did our own investigating. But it's still spreading online. And so you can see that there's something untrue that's being deliberately spread to try to mislead people, and that's clear disinformation. And again, it's, it's the outrage factor. It's worth noting that, that these have been shared thousands of times each. It's not always that clear cut, though. No. So another example, also with Morneau, he put out a tweet with an old video of conservative leader Andrew Scheer. This is something the liberals have been doing a lot during this campaign. And in the tweet, Morneau suggests that Scheer is saying he's going to try very hard to hide any kind of spending cuts from Canadians. But if you watch the video, it's not exactly what he says. When it comes to making tough decisions and cuts, I do agree that's very important, but we also have to be very, very careful about how we communicate that to people. And so I think that the Conservatives would probably say that Morneau is lying. He would probably say that he's reading between the lines. And the truth is actually somewhere in the middle. So that's where it gets really hard to kind of piece apart. But in this case, I would say it's not disinformation, it's just politics. And again, always the emotional outrage factor. Kaylee, thanks very much. Kaylee and the disinformation unit uh, with CBC News will be here with us fairly frequently as we head up to the vote because we'll have a lot to talk about. Ian is back in two minutes with stories developing around the world tonight. Plus, a growing number of kids experiencing anxiety over the environment. Their story coming up. Welcome back to the National Newsroom in Vancouver. Large parts of Bermuda have been plunged into darkness tonight as powerful winds from Hurricane Umberto begin to pummel the British territory. Bermuda's government is urging people to stay off the streets during this powerful Category 3 storm, which started to hit the islands this afternoon. More than 27,000 homes are without power, and hurricane force winds are expected overnight and well into tomorrow. It's been more than 24 hours since voting ended in Israel, and the winner still not clear. The two leading parties were in a virtual dead heat. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressed legislators today, saying he had met with right-wing factions who had pledged to work with him to form the next government, but he didn't give an indication on how they would do that. Netanyahu also took aim at a possible Benny Gantz-led coalition that would rely on support from Arab members of parliament. With all the uncertainty, Netanyahu cancelled his annual speech at the UN that was to take place next week. And Canada has lost a devoted champion of Canadian literature. But we still have to strengthen bookstores. We still have to do something about copyright. Uh, we, we've still got to maintain uh, the, the, the possibilities for, for people to, to read good books and uh, have good books written. A respected novelist, Graham Gibson, was also the longtime partner of Margaret Atwood, whose publisher announced his death today at the age of 85. 
Atwood said, we're devastated by the loss of Graham, but we're happy that he achieved the kind of swift exit he wanted and avoided the decline into further dementia that he feared. Still ahead on the national, kids suffering from fear, worry, anxiety, and we're not talking back to school, but rather climate change. Their story, next. Welcome back. We want to talk now about a surprising issue increasingly facing young people. It's eco-anxiety. As part of CBC's ongoing climate series, In Our Backyard, Christine Birak takes a closer look at how young Canadians are coping with anxiety that stems from the climate crisis. Feelings of fear. My generation is facing a future of economic instability. Uncertainty. Food scarcity extreme weather events and helplessness and we the children are desperate emma lim is pledging not to have children as the impacts of a changing climate creep closer a recent american survey found most teenagers are frightened and a growing number of young people around the world are being treated for eco-anxiety they don't realize where it's going it goes straight to the ocean Growing up on Prince Edward Island, Paige Martin started feeling nervous about climate change in high school. When you hear about the plastic and the rising sea levels, not only us, but you hear a lot of fishermen talk about just how scary it is and how scary our future can look if we don't change our ways. Doctors say eco-anxiety or fears around climate change aren't irrational. The environment can impact the long-term physical and mental health of children in ways that don't impact adults. We know that children breathe more air, they eat more food, they drink more water per kilogram body weight. The Canadian Pediatric Society recently published a list of climate-related threats to children and their bodies, noting heat and cold-related deaths disproportionately affect infants and kids, along with air pollution, contaminated water, the rising risk of infections and the effects of extreme weather. It's about being reassuring, but being honest about what's happening and uh, discussing what we can do to be part of the solution. Julia Woodhall Melnick studied the toll flooding took on families in New Brunswick last year, sweeping away homes, precious belongings and peace of mind. Some needed medical help to cope, but for most, a renewed sense of community was vital. So there were instances of moms taking their you know, very young children and bringing them to sandbag for their neighbours. We were thinking of the secondhand toy sale. Paige Martin started a nonprofit called Green Everlasting. It's given her back a sense of control over her life and shared responsibility. They're getting out and taking action because they don't want the world to end up the way it's going. Channeling fear, hoping they can do better for the next generation of children. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Stay with us more on our top story. That photo that surfaced of Justin Trudeau in brownface right after the break. Back to our breaking news tonight, a dramatic night in Canadian politics on day eight of the election campaign. Justin Trudeau holding an emergency news conference tonight on his airplane to apologize after Time magazine published a photo of him from 2001 wearing brown face. We'll show you the image again that shook the election campaign. Tonight, Canadians are talking about that photo and its impact, and so are their leaders. We've heard from all of them. A look again at some of the comments from tonight. Let's begin with Justin Trudeau. I'm going to be uh, asking Canadians to forgive me for what I did. I shouldn't have done that. I take responsibility for it. It was a dumb thing to do. I'm disappointed in myself. I'm pissed off at myself for having done it. I wish I hadn't done it, but I did it and I apologize for it. Wearing brown face is an act of open mockery and racism. It was just as racist in 2001 as it is in 2019. And what Canadians saw this evening is someone with a complete lack of judgment and integrity. When I was growing up, I fought racists. I dealt with them myself and I fought back. But I got a message from a friend who reminded me that there's a lot of people out there that couldn't do that. They couldn't fight back. They didn't have the ability to do that. They couldn't, they couldn't do it themselves. And I think that it's going to hurt 
to see this. It's going to hurt them a lot. Just some of the early reaction to this breaking news story tonight. Of course, we will also want to hear from you, the voters, about what you think of all this. We'll continue to track the story tonight on CBC News Network, cbc.ca, and we'll have more, of course, tomorrow. That is The National for Wednesday, September 18th. Thanks for joining us.